Okay. Mute. Okay. Good evening and a happy new year to everybody that's on the committee, all the officers and also those people who are watching us on the internet. Um, my name is Councillor Amrit Mann and I'm the chair of the planning committee. It's literally five o'clock now, so I'd like to welcome all of you to this virtual meeting of Hounslow's planning committee. I would like to welcome members of the committee who are sitting this evening, as well as council officers who will be assisting members throughout this evening. In addition, I would like to welcome members of the public who are watching this meeting at home. The way this meeting will work will be that as chair, I will be running the meeting and inviting people to speak. As it is very easy for people to speak over each other in meetings like this, I will ask each member or officer to speak in turn at the appropriate stage. This will mean that there should normally be no need for people to interrupt or to ask to speak. However, I shall make sure that members have ample opportunity to ask questions and make comments on the reports and applications before them. The exception to this arrangement will be the legal committee or planning officers who may turn on their microphone to alert me to any legal governance or planning issue that needs addressing, although I would expect this to be a rare occurrence. In addition, we have a producer of the meeting from our ICT department who may also contact me if necessary, but I think it is unlikely if all goes well, which I hope it will. The etiquette for members of the committee and for officers who are expecting to speak will be to mute your microphone until you're asked to speak. This means that only one person will be speaking at a time and there will be no background noise, making it easier for all of us to follow the meeting and for those who are watching at home. I will also ask members to always say who they are when they make a contribution and to speak more slowly and clearly for the same reason. We have six members of the planning committee with us here this evening and it is we who will be making the decisions. Officers of the council will provide assistance and advice as required, but the final decision will be made by the members. So members. Going on to our introductions. Now, may I introduce each of my members here tonight one by one. I will start with myself. My name is Councillor Amrit Mann and I'm the chair of this committee. I am also the ward council for Heston East. Can I now invite Councillor Richard Foote as my vice chair to introduce himself? Good evening, everyone. I'm Councillor Richard Foote, Councillor for Hamworth and vice chair of the, of the planning committee. Thank you, Richard. Can I now ask Councillor Michael Dennis to introduce himself? Uh, good evening. Yes, my name is Councillor Michael Dennis and I am uh, the Councillor for Chiswick Riverside Ward. Thank you, Michael. Now, can I ask Councillor Ajmer Garwal to introduce herself? Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. I'm Councillor Ajmer Garwal and um, I represent Hounslow Central Ward. OK, thank you, Ajmer. Can I ask Councillor Salman Shaheen to introduce himself? Hello, I'm Salman Shaheen. I'm councillor for Isleworth Ward and chair of the Isleworth and Brentford Area Forum. Thank you, Salman. And last, Councillor Mohamed Omer. Good evening, I'm Councillor Mohamed Omer, councillor for Felton West Ward and a member of the planning committee and the chair of Badford Hanworth and Felton Area Forum. OK, thank you, Councillor Omer. Um, can I now invite uh, my officers, starting with uh, Matthew Rees? Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Rees. I'm the Head of Development Management and I'll be presenting uh, one, three of the items, sorry, this evening. Thank you. Um, and also Kieran Coughlin. Good evening. My name is Kieran Coughlin and I'm a Transport Officer with the Council. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, can I now invite officers representing legal and governance to introduce themselves, starting with Patrick Kelly. Hello, my name is Patrick Kelly and I'm the legal advisor for this evening's meeting. 
Thank you, Patrick. Uh, can I ask uh, Wendy Mary to introduce herself? Good evening, I'm Wendy Mary, and I'm from Democratic Services. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, now, Chaspal Sandhu. Good evening, I'm Chaspal Sandhu, and I'm here from Democratic Services. Thank you, Chaspal. Um, we also have officers acting a producing role for the technical side of this meeting, but as they're not expected to be involved in the discussion of the meeting, I will thank them for their help, but not ask them to introduce themselves. But they are, I think, Sadiq to, for, for tonight. OK, now moving on for further information. It's a bit laborious, but uh, we'll get through it, right? So we're coming towards the end. Um, members of the public are reminded that the agenda and all reports being considered by the committee tonight can be found on the council website under the planning committee meetings page. So if you want to see them, that is where to look. I also want to make sure that all members have seen the agenda and reports. So uh, guys, all the paperwork you've, you've received it, seen it, OK, that's fine. Let me move on then. I'd like to remind members of the need to hear all the evidence in each report we are considering tonight. This is a legal requirement and I will be asking you to confirm you have heard the whole debate before you vote on any matter this evening. So it's prescriptive. Um, most of you have been through this and, and we'll, we'll know how that to present when it comes to the vote. OK, so if you should find you're having technical problems and need to log out of the meeting and come back in, please let me know immediately, ideally beforehand, but if not afterwards by turning on your microphone. This would be a permitted interruption. We can then decide how far we need to recap if that is necessary or if the member needs not to vote on that item. Finally, I would say to any member of the public listening or watching, thank you for joining us this evening. We hope that this meeting will go well, but any virtual meetings may suffer from unexpected, unexpected technical hitches. So please do bear with us. I should also clarify that this meet meeting is being recorded and it will be made available on the Council's YouTube channel in the next few days. Contributors to the meeting are asked to remember that they will therefore be included in the recording of this public meeting. So thank you and let's move on to the first item on the agenda. And that is apologies for absence. I've had no apologies. We've got a full house. So let me move on to item two, which is declarations of interest under the town planning code of guidance or any other communication from members. So um, I seen Councillor Dennis's hand go up and then Councillor Ajma Garwal. So let, let, let me start with uh, Councillor Michael Dennis. Michael. Uh, thank you, Chair. I had, no, I, I thought I might have a conflict of interest with items uh, five and seven, um, but I had a very constructive uh, chat with Mr. Kelly, who's our legal representative, and he reassured me that on looking at the details, um, there was no conflict of interest, so I, I'm I'm ready ready to go with an open mind for all the items. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, Ajme. I uh, just had uh, quite a few emails regarding agenda item number seven. Okay, Councillor Richard Foote and Mohammed Amir. Yeah, I've had the same massive amount of emails coming in and I gave up when the pros and cons were equal. Okay, um, uh, if if that's the same, uh, I would assume that it's the same for every one of us on yes, this I committee, understand. including myself. So someone, if, if that's the same, or is it, it is something much. different? Okay, that's fine, Mohammed. Is that same, correct? Same. Yeah. That's okay. Correct. So, if if it be noted that we've all received some form of communication from uh, the applicants uh, here tonight on item four, five, six, and seven. Okay. Right. Let me move on then to the minutes. Right. We now come to the minutes of the meeting held in on the third of December. So, I'm going to take matters arising and accuracy together. Right. So can I ask members if there's any corrections that they wish to proceed? Please speak now, but I'll go page by page. So page three. Page four. And page five, was there anything that 
you wanted to bring up on page three, page four, page five, or can I sign them off as being all agreed and correct? OK, agreed. thank you. Thank you. Great. So usually I would sign a physical copy of the minutes, but as this is currently impractical, I shall ask the committee officer to ensure that I am provided with a paper copy to sign either by post or when it's possible to attend Hounslow House. In the meantime, the minutes will formally record that we've agreed the minutes as a correct record of the last meeting. So we're now moving on to the main uh, agenda and there's a few housekeeping uh, issues that we need to sort out. Um, time contribution. Time contribution, I will ask the legal officer to alert me to when allocated timing has been reached. I will also ask her to alert me prior to the, uh, him, sorry, I beg your pardon. I will also ask him to alert me prior to the guillotine being reached if we've not concluded the meeting by this time. Uh, fortunately, we only have the one speaker and the speaker has five minutes. Uh, that's all we get. If you need any extra, you'll have to go to the Halifax, but <laughs> but but that that's that's in keeping with all the protocol. Right. OK, may I remind all members, officers and public speakers at this meeting to introduce themselves each time they speak and also to turn off their microphones when they finish speaking. It is also important to speak slowly and clearly so that everybody can understand what you're saying. Finally, if you're making a reference to any agenda documentation, please give the page and paragraph details. As to how we're going to run the meeting, um, the officer, this is there's a slight change from uh, the last meeting. Uh, some of the other uh, members, it, it's not too different, but um, we're going to ask the officer to present uh, a summary, well, an in-depth uh, uh, report on the application. So uh, the summary that we used to have, that's going to be now at the end so that the officer can pick up any loose uh, um, um, questions or uh, items for information. So um, we're going to have on this item, um, Matthew present the main report. Then I will ask um, the speaker to speak on this particular item, right, Deborah, and then we will have a um, discussion on this and then I'll ask for a brief summary from the officer before we move to the vote. OK, so let's go to the agenda item, which is item seven. I'm taking that uh, out of uh, sync simply because we have a speaker. So um, Matthew, Matthew is going to be presenting item seven. Matthew, over to you. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm trying to share my screen at the moment, so hopefully it'll be up on your screens shortly with a very short presentation on the first one. Um, sorry, this is going to take a little bit of explaining, so please do bear with me because this is not a uh, formal standard planning application. And um, what is 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 uh, the request a request to delegate authority to officers to um, start the process of imposing an Article 4 direction. And I'll explain exactly what that means, hopefully in as much detail as I can. Um, so hopefully what's showing your screen at the moment is Brentford Dock, which is a development from the 1970s, uh, around uh, 590 homes uh, within the area. It's bordered by the River Thames, as you can see um, to the east on the right hand side, um, the River Brent to the north and uh, Sion Park to the south west. So it's, 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 it's something of an island within, within the borough. Um, what we are proposing is an Article 4 direction to restrict the erection of gates outside the curtilages of private dwelling houses. So essentially the erection of gates um, not in the public realm, but outside the curtilage of properties. So um, if I start off an Article 4 direction, so um, hopefully members are aware of uh, what permitted development rights are. They're effectively um, a mechanism through which someone may erect a structure without the need for planning permission. So they wouldn't need to come through us for permission to an erect a structure that is permitted development. Um, one of such structure is a gate wall, fence or other means of enclosure um, that is not on a public highway or fronting a public highway such subject to certain height restrictions. So on uh, within Brentford Dock, it is open to um, a resident to erect on lands um, 
uh, boundary treatment. So um, up to two metres high, they can erect boundary treatment to obviously restrict the free movement of pedestrians. So the issue with this uh, site is that the erection of such boundary treatment would prevent people, members of the public, um, walking through the Brentford Dock development area um, and towards and enjoying the, the riverside and the riverside walk um, on or around the site. So effectively, what would be happening is that we would be removing permitted development rights for the erection of boundary treatment that would pre prevent pedestrians from freely accessing the River Thames frontage and, and other areas within this site. Um, just to re just to give a bit more uh, information behind the process, um, an Article 4 direction doesn't say you can't do it, it doesn't say you can't erect boundary treatment, it says you need planning permission to erect a structure. So that would bring, bring um, the um, any proposal for a, a boundary treatment would be within our control. So members, officers would be able to exercise their um, um, exercise authority to approve or refuse an application. So if you were to grant authority to officers to start this process, what would happen is that we would impose the Article 4 direction um, with immediate effect or uh, within a certain time frame where we can get the paperwork done. Um, with that in place, uh, they, within the area, they would not be able to erect this boundary treatment uh, for a period of six months. Um, within those six months, we start the formal consultation process on this Article 4 direction. So that is the point where anyone who is impacted by the proposal would then get to make their representations on it. Um, when that consultation period has expired, we would bring it back to planning committee. And it's at that point that we would confirm or not confirm the Article 4 direction. So effectively, if it's confirmed that was it, it would be imposed. Um, boundary treatment could not be erected without planning permission. If members chose not to uh, um, uh, impose it, then it falls away. Permitted development rights are back intact. So what's happened is that because we're simply asking for authority to kick off this process and the subsequent consultation as part of it, um, we've obviously added it to this committee agenda and um, members of the public have seen it on this agenda and have chosen to make comment at this stage, which is it's technically not the stage we invite representations, but um, I'm, I'm sure members would like to hear a bit of background as to what residents' concerns are with this um, as part of this process before they make their decision as to start it off or not. So that's why we've, uh, um, that's why there's a speaker tonight. Um, and I am very wary that you've all received a lot of correspondence on the site. Um, I make the final count up to this point as it 11 objections to the application and I think there are four letters in support that members have, have had sight of. Um, there have been four subsequent to the uh, uh, addendum um, report that I published so I outlined uh, what the objections are relating to within the addendum. Um, you can add two letters of support and two objection letters of objection to the addendum. Um, and I'll broadly outline what those emails said. Sorry, I appreciate that they were sent to yourselves, but I think there might have been a bit of a scattergun approach as to which members they were forwarded to. Um, and they, they're large to the, uh, the ownership, um, it's private lands. Um, residents feel that they have the right to enjoy um, their peace and uh, privacy um, of the lands that leads up to it and the River Thames footway. Um, they have to pay a fee for the maintenance of this 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 land and so they feel that we shouldn't be imposing any uh, restrictions on so they feel that they should have the right to be able to restrict access to this land because they pay a certain fee for upkeep and landscaping and such um, and there's some concerns about um, hazardous it's hazardous having uh, members of the public using these these pathways and footpaths um, collisions have been mentioned lack, lack of social distance being has been mentioned. So that's that's broadly the background to the objections that are being raised. So we are proposing to start this consultation process with a view to imposing an Article 4 direction to stop uh, access being restricted for members of the public. And uh, I'll leave it at that point if that's OK. I'm sorry if I've muddled it a little bit. I'm hoping that's relatively clear what we're trying to do here. So um, I'll um, leave it to the speakers and then maybe round up any questions afterwards if that's OK. OK, um, let, let me let me ask my members for questions to you, Matthew. Uh, any, any issues we'll pick up afterwards and then I'll, I'll invite the speaker after the questioning, right? Yes. If that's OK. Yeah, right, OK. So uh, let me go in terms of uh, order. Uh, Richard, um, start with you first. Any questions to Matthew on his report? Yeah. Um, right. I, I'm, I'm familiar with Article 4 because we, we introduced one in Hamworth, of course. Um, Absolutely, yeah. 
it's quite a lengthy business, but uh, eventually got there. Um, now the uh, situation on this one, the, 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 um, are we saying that this estimated time for this would be uh, sometime within the six months that we would be reaching the point of implementing Article 4 if that was the so decision? Sure. So, so your the Article 4 direction that, that covered Hanworth for the HMOs, that was a non-immediate Article 4 direction. So after the imposition of it, you had to wait a year um, for it to take effect. Because this is boundary treatment, we can do an immediate Article 4 direction. So we can impose it straight away and then retrospectively consult on it, which is you know obviously why we've, we've received the comments at this stage. So this will have immediate effect as soon as we've done the paperwork associated with it. And then um, consultation period after it's been imposed. Six months later, you decide whether or not to um, ratify what um, to um, go with it to impose the Article 4 direction in finality or, or indeed not. OK, Can I, that, that leads me to my second question because I've seen in one of the many letters, I had a lot more than you seem to have had. I, mean, I think it's certainly more than four or 11, but um, uh, there's in one in, in several of those was um, uh, comments about that uh, contractors had already started erecting gates um, yeah so there is is that the case and is there any action we can take on that so my understanding and i'm i have seen some photographs that fences gating was was starting to be erected yesterday i'm slightly speculating now councillor um because i haven't been down there to see them myself but i have seen pictures so what happens in this situation is that insofar as an article 4 direction is concerned uh we freeze time when the Article 4 is issued. So anything before the Article 4 is issued is, is, is allowed to say. So they've effectively got inside the cutoff point for whatever they erect before the Article 4 kicks in. Um, my understanding is that the gates that was referred to is right to the northwest of the site. There is still some permeability through to the river and there may be actions outside of planning controls that could be taken. It's not for myself and indeed not for this 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 um, planning committee to, to, to comment or, or uh, may, um, take issue with what may be done outside the scope of this. But um, no, in planning terms, it's permitted development to erect those that that, that fencing the gates. OK, Richard. Okay. Yep. OK, let, let me move on then to Council Michael Dennis. Any questions to uh, Matthew at this point? Uh, good evening, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, no, no further questions from me. Thank you. OK, moving on to Councillor Ajme Garawal. Any questions to Matthew at this stage? Hi, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, what um, instigated this um, Article 4? If the, from what I gather, that this development has been there since the 70s, so what made you think you want this article for direction now? Um, you're, you're asking me to comment on uh, something slightly outside of, of, of planning control. I mean, what I will say is, as what, you've, what you've, you've already been reported, is that gates have been installed, which is why this has come to a head now. Um, this is why the Article 4 direction is coming forward. There's, there's no point. There's, there's not a coincidence, I don't think. I think there have been um, the, the idea, I think, was raised that gates could be installed here, which, which raised this issue. OK, so um, from um, the emails, what we've seen, the gates apparently have gone up. So is there another way that the public can get to the river? Or is it totally blocked off on this side for them? Uh, no, so the gates that I'm aware of, sorry, and as I say, I haven't been down today to the site, um, don't block off all public access to the river. They, they block off access from the northern side over the bridge, the footbridge uh, towards the river. Um, there is still access along the roads, is my understanding, because there's quite a bit of permeability. There's, there's a few routes through to the river um, uh, from the roads, through the buildings and to the south of the site as well. And to my knowledge, those those areas haven't been blocked off yet. Um, as, yeah. OK, thank you. Thanks, Chair. OK, right. Let me move on to Councillor Salman Shaheen. Uh, thank you very much, um, Chair. So, well, first of all, um, my first question was uh, has already been put by Richard, but I do want to just contribute to it a little bit. Uh, for, for the record, although I'm councillor for Isleworth Ward, I live in Brentford and I was down at the site about three hours ago and I saw the gates going up. They're very much going up. Um, and uh, very, they're very much going up clearly because of this meeting here tonight and they, there's clearly a big rush to uh, to get those erected. They're not finished yet. Um, so if we to, were to vote tonight to freeze, to allow you to freeze that in time, um, there would still be permeability to, to the river. So just to j just to relay what I've, I've seen there. Um, 
I mean, the, the, the second question that I have really is, is around the justification for these gates. I mean, I'm, I, yeah, one should always be sympathetic, of course, to any, any, any residents of any area who are um, concerned about antisocial behaviour. But ha have we seen any evidence of this? And I, I, I personally have never seen any evidence of it. I've, I've walked that path around the, uh, around the, the Thames many times because it is such a, a beautiful spot in, uh, in, in Brentford. Have, uh, have we seen any recorded evidence of, uh, of antisocial behaviour there? Or, or lack of social distancing. I mean, it's often uh, it, it often a very distant place from from my point of view. So, I mean, to, to my knowledge, no. There's there's people who are better positioned to say this. I dare say representations may have stories of of concerns over lack of social distancing and 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 um, any any misdemeanour that's happened. But I think I think the key thing that I want to say here is that they will give given the opportunity to make these representations before we decide this is final or not. So there is, it's, it's all in built into the process to give them the chance to have their say. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that, Matthew. That's uh, that's all my questions. OK, thank you, Salman. Uh, Councillor Mohamed Amir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just, uh, just a clarification uh, from yourself, Rhys. Um, should this article be implemented would there be any impact on the gates that are now being put on or being erected? It, considering that they took these were installed during the uh, during the discussions, were in or the negotiations were in place. So um, unfortunately, in terms of planning, as I say, this is uh, I have to keep saying this. Um, an Article Four direction, it, 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 when it comes in, that's it chops off time effectively. So anything before the Article Four direction, it's not impacted on. It's anything subject to the date the Article Four uh, um, direction is imposed is impacted on. So any gates that are installed previous to it would not be subject to this Article Four direction. So it would be if there is another system through which the gates are removed, then my understanding is that then the Article 4 direction would kick in. So if the gates are removed for other systems, then I, th I think the Article 4 direction would then restrict further gating being installed. OK, uh, Council Mayor. Okay. Thank you. OK, that's fine. Right. Uh, Amber, I'll just yeah. come on a point that uh, Matthew raised, uh, a reference to the footbridge. Um, is, 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 it, is it a question? Because I don't want to get into a debate. It's a question about the footbridge. I understood was the footbridge was a, a London Borough of Hounslow uh, erection. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's it's, it's not on the footbridge, Councillor. Um, the, the gate that's been erected, if you come off the footbridge, turn left, uh, go down about five metres, that's where the gate that I understand has been installed is. So um, we so the footbridge from use? It doesn't block the footbridge off from use, no. All right. OK, you, you, you'll get you'll get a further opportunity to ask Matthew for any anything else after we've had uh, uh, Deborah speak. Um, now, basically, we want to go on to Deborah. She's the objector. There are, there are no other speakers. Um, so, Deborah, you have five minutes right, to do your pitch. Uh, let me know when you're ready and then we'll start the clock ticking. OK, thank you. I'm ready. OK, let's go. Thank you. My name is Deborah Sharples. I'm a solicitor representing Brentford Dock Enterprises Limited. who instructed me to speak tonight and thank you very much for agreeing to let me speak. Um, I have written a letter to the members of the committee um, about the legal issues surrounding the use of an Article 4 direction in this situation. I don't intend to repeat those points now, but I do ask you to give careful consideration for the officers to give careful consideration to what I have said. Um, the power that's given to the local planning authority to make an Article 4 direction can only legally be used for the purposes for which it was given, and it was not given to facilitate public access to private land. Those arguments concern the legality rather than the merits of the case. It doesn't matter from this point of view whether they may be able to get planning permission by express consent anyway. Um, the question is whether the council should be using its powers for these purposes. The guidance from the government in the National Planning NPPF paragraph 53 is that the use of Article 4 directions to remove national permitted development rights should be limited to situations where this is necessary to protect local amenity or the well-being of the area. The national guidance confirms that they are a tool which should be used sparingly and for planning purposes only. It is accepted that if the gardens at Brentford Dock were a public facility, they would be a local amenity as referred to in the MPPF guidance, but they are not. They are private land and under the terms of their lease, the tenants and residents of the Brentford Dock estate are entitled to the benefit of them. Uh, 
That gives around 1,200 to 1,500 people the private right to use them. All the communal um, spaces on the estate are privately maintained and that maintenance is paid for by the tenants of the flats on the estate. There is no public funding of the communal facilities. My clients understand that the council would like the gardens to be public, but it is not the function of the Article 4 power to use it to oblige a landowner to allow public access to private land. The gardens, along with the other communal spaces at Brentford Dock, are pri privately owned by Brentford Dock Limited and they are privately maintained. The report to committee implies that there is public access through the site from adopted highways onto the Thames footpath, but the definitive map, and I provided you all with a copy of that, shows that there is no public right of way providing access to the gardens on the riverfront. The adopted highways do not provide access and the remainder of the estate is private and there are many signs displayed to make that clear. The heritage trail referred to in the report to committee is not a public right of way. The tenants pay around £200 per month per flat for landscaping, maintenance, cleaning and security in respect to the communal areas on the estate. Communal facilities are provided for the tenants, including table tennis tables and barbecue areas. It is simply unfair on the tenants, who include tenants of the Council of Affordable Housing, if other people who pay nothing for them are able to access them on equal terms. It is not reasonable, I suggest, to require tenants to pay to provide, clean and maintain a public park. Recent public use has led to littering and fouling of the area, which has had to be cleaned up at the tenant's expense and to noise and disturbance for residents, particularly at night. Such an injustice can only be harmful to the well-being of the area. There are many parks in the area within a short distance which are open to the public and are maintained at the public expense. These provide public immunity for leisure and recreation. The owners and tenants of this estate are entitled to take appropriate steps to protect their own position and neither Article 4 nor the local plan are an appropriate mechanism to prevent them from doing so. I ask you for these reasons to vote against this proposal because by delegating the power you allow an Article 4 direction to be made immediately and that will result in significant harm to the interests of the tenants of the estate. Thank you very much. That's all I want to say. OK, thank you, right. Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. If there are any questions, of course, no, no, I'm, happy to I'm, answer. I'm, I'm going to ask them. Right. Let me go through the running order. Councillor Richard Foote, questions to Deborah Sharples. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, can I ask, is it right to say that public access to this site has been um, there and available since the site was first erected? Um, I can't speak personally for what has actually happened. I think it is the case and accept it's the case that the public have been, as a matter of fact, accessing the area, but there are many signs up that say it's not public and which would prevent the um, public from acquiring a right. So what I'm referring to here is that there is no right for the public to access that area. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, we can always pick this up with the officer, right? Um, Councillor Michael Dennis, any questions to Deborah? Um, um, sorry, thank you, and no question for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Right. Councillor Ajmer Garwal, any questions to Deborah? Just a very quick one. Um, as you say that the public has been uh, accessing that area, has there ever been any trouble, which is why they made wanted to put the gates up or what's happened now after 40 odd years that they wanted to put gates up? Um, my understanding is that um, the amount of access has very much increased recently, very possibly because of COVID and lockdowns and people's needs to get out and into the open air. Um, and there have been quite a number of incidents of um, well, recently of what you refer to as antisocial behaviour that's left the area really quite dirty um, and also used gathering at night around the picnic tables and causing a lot of noise and then leaving bottles and litter and so on behind them when they go. So I think it's it's become a situation which is causing problems and when maybe it didn't cause problems so much in the past. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Salman Shaheen, any questions? 
Yeah, well, I can. I mean, I can certainly confirm that the uh, the the public have been walking a around that that area un unfettered, and I I know of people who who tell me that they've walked around that area for forty years. Uh, when did the signs go up, and what was the legal justification for putting those signs up? Um, I can't tell you in this context. Um, simply because it hasn't been something I've had to look into yet, exactly when those signs went up. Um, I am instructed that they've been up for at least 20 years. So, uh, so then you can confirm that for 20 years the public was walking around there with, uh, with no one telling them they couldn't walk around there? No, I can't confirm that. Um, all I can tell you is that um, I am instructed that the signs that are currently there went up about 20 years ago. There may well have been signs earlier than that. Um, I don't yet have information about that because I haven't yet investigated it. And anyway, I simply can't tell you because I just don't know what was happening more than 20 years ago or indeed last year. That's something. Okay. If somebody was wanting to try and establish a public right, that would all have to be looked into in a different context to this. OK, thank you very much. OK. Uh, Councillor Mohamed Amir, any questions to Deborah? No comments from myself, Chair. Thank you. OK, and no questions from myself. So, Deborah, thank you for making your pitch. Uh, let me go back to the committee. Um, Matthew, can I bring you in? And if you do the brief summary of picking up the points raised in questions to yourself and also to the objector. So trying to tease out some of the difficult issues. And then we'll ask a, another round of questions from the members to see if there's any any issues that they still need out, um, outstanding to be ironed out. OK, so Richard Furt, questions to Matthew. Sorry, Ma Matthew, your, your, your brief summary. Your response. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's fine because I, I won't take long on this one because I think I think um, De Deborah is she's she's essentially presented the other side of the coin for a large area of the issues and, and you've seen the emails and the objections that have come through so it's it's restricting public access um, versus um, that the local residents wanting to um, making the case as to why they should be able to keep it for themselves and um, what I would say again to that is the point I've raised before is that an article four direction it does have inbuilt to it an exercise which is public consultation and we will consider any um, any um, representations that are made of that consultation process and as I say that's when members can decide to, to, to go ahead or not go ahead with this article 4 direction so it, it's all inbuilt into the process. Um, there were some legal, legal issues lays, raised there um, prior to bringing this forward to yourselves I did consult with uh, our legal advisors about whether or not a, a, an article 4 direction could be here the advice offered was that we could indeed do that um, when it talks about protecting um, local immunity and all the well-being of the area um, I, I I don't necessarily agree that that means that they just mean the immediate area, i.e. the residents in Brentford Dock. I would suggest that means the wider area in general. Um, at this point, though, um, if it's OK, um, we do have a legal advisor here, Patrick. So would you like to hear from him briefly on, on the legal position for, um, from his point of view? Absolutely. Uh, Patrick? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, thanks, Matthew. Uh, I, suppose I just wanted to maybe um, um, and Matthew did summarise the uh, process, uh, but I just wanted to maybe the terminologies um, just to put a more legal uh, uh, spin on the uh, on the on the on the may, on the Article Four direction. The terminology. So you're ask, being asked tonight to delegate authority to make uh, an immediate Article Four direction uh, once the. Um, subject to you, uh, the council or, or the uh, authority being granted for that. Um, the the immediate Article 4 will take effect uh, once it's served upon uh, the uh, owners and occupiers. Uh, there is a, a, a process of um, advertising, a technical process that has to be done with uh, making it public. So that has to be done. So uh, it an immediate article four comes into effect as soon as it's served and uh, then there is a, a minimum the, the council can grant a consultation period uh, the minimum is 21 days uh, but the, as I say the council can make it uh, a little bit uh, more than that if they so wish um, 
with an immediate Article 4, uh, as Matthew has said, uh, the Council, it, it must be uh, confirmed within six months of a uh, notice being uh, given, otherwise it lapses. So uh, the intention here is uh, for the Article 4 direction to be made uh, and comment effect upon notice being given. And uh, then uh, following uh, following the consultation period, uh, the, the council will bring back a report to committee, uh, uh, will we'll consider all the representations made, and it'll be up to uh, the committee then to decide whether to confirm it or not. Uh, so as Matthew says, uh, uh, th there is a, a mechanism for the representations to be made and, and the council's duty bound to consider those. Um, in terms of uh, an Article 4 direction in relation to private land, uh, it can uh, be applied to private land. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, the, uh, an Article 4 direction can be used to uh, prevent a, a, a change of use which is permitted under the uh, permitted development rights that, that's affecting private property or construction of uh, you know, it could be some local authorities have done them on basements, for instance. So again, that's on private land. So an Article 4 direction can be used in relation to private land. It's not usurping any uh, 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 property rights or ownership rights. That's not the purpose of it. And as Matthew says, it's not denying, uh, it's not taking away forever the right to do anything. It's basically taking away the deemed right that is granted under the, the permitted uh, development rights, uh, under the general, general per per permitted development order. So it's taking that away and that development then will be, uh, if permission is sought, it, uh, it must be done through an express uh, planning application, which gives the local authority the opportunity to apply its relevant policies and uh, as with every other application, uh, it'll be deemed, it'll be considered on its merit. Uh, and of course, again, in the event that uh, the council refuses planning permission, there is the right of appeal in the normal way. Okay, Patrick, thank you. That's uh, quite an extensive in-depth um, run through your permitted rights and uh, Article 4. Okay, Matthew. We did you want to add anything to? No, that's fine. Thank you, Councillor. OK, so uh, you, you finished with your summary, yes? That, that yes, please. Yeah. OK, uh, Richard, any 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 further thoughts, any questions to at the moment questions dis discussion we will have afterwards uh, to oh. to Matthew? Mm, no, not no questions at the moment, but I'll come back in and um, comment later, um, that, which might generate a question in its comment, but I'll, I'll leave it till then. OK, all right. Uh, Councillor Michael Dennis, any further thoughts? Oh, um, uh, what is the position of the uh, uh, this uh, block being built? Would that have, uh, would that, would that support this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, um, would that support the the, the officer's uh, uh, recommendation uh, in highway, despite the uh, the presence of this private privately owned land? Okay, um, Michael, uh, we 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 miss some of the, or it wasn't quite clear. The question you're asking simply because of your uh, uh, internet connection. Could right. could you could you run through it again, and maybe Matthew will pick it up. Sorry, Matthew. Um, can you hear me now? I yes. think yeah, just about. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, the the um, the fact that it's been used as a public highway before 1972. Does, would that does that affect this? Uh, application in, in support of the officer's recommendation? Um, 
to suggest it was used as a public highway before 1972, it was an industrial estate. Oh, um, I see. Yeah. So it, it wasn't, um, I think it was still private land. I'm going to tend to do suggest without being fully informed on the mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that helps the case per se. But as I say, it's, it's strictly in planning terms. It, it, no, it wouldn't make any difference to, to yeah. how we how we do this. Sure. All right. That, that was all I was going to ask. Thank you. Thanks OK. Councillor Ajmer Garwal, any further questions to Michael? So, any further questions to Matthew? No, I'm fine, thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Salman Shaheen? No further questions, I'll comment afterwards. Okay. Councillor Mohammed Amir, any further questions? No further questions, Chair, thank you. Okay. Myself, no further questions to you, Matthew, but uh, stay on the line. Okay, uh, colleagues, now discussion, comments, debate. So, uh, Councillor Richard Foote, thoughts yeah um really I'm, I'm i'm quite intrigued by the the heritage uh, matter because my history learnings were did it had any effect upon uh my schooling uh, i seem to remember that this area was very much um linked in with the cromwell uh situation um and, and was very active in in that particular arena and i'm wondering you know if that is the case i mean i know we've got a an industrial estate that's been built in between but uh, you know, it was sometime after cromwell was doing his marching up and down but um yeah i'm just wondering i mean you know when we talk about heritage we should also be just trying to think about the historical uh area and, and, and what it is because that's just as impactive on there as, as anything else and and certainly um I don't know. I would have thought that if it does have a, a, a fairly deep historical background, then it, it strengthens the right to say that this should be um, open to public uh, access. OK. OK, um, I mean, in, in terms of before we get into a, a deep seated uh, uh, debate, but we want we want to stay just with the application rather than some of the questions which are out of our committee's jurisdiction in terms of private, public access. So we want, we want to stay clear that we want, want really to confine ourselves to what's in front of us and, and decide on that basis. So um, Councillor Michael Dennis, any thoughts, comments, debate? Thank you. Uh, no, I am. Um... <clears throat> I am I am largely sympathetic to the views of those who say that it is a private land um, and that it is uh, that, that therefore they, they <laughs> it's it may be unfair on them that members of the public are coming here and using land which is being paid for by them and not not by the public. But I, I am I'm also um, I'm also uh, being uh, affected by what the officers have said in, in the in the recommendation, and you know the fact that there could be a there could be a gate, but that it would it would follow due process uh, as and go through the, the procedure for planning. That gives me a lot of hope that you know it, it would be looked at properly, and and that that so I therefore I am leaning towards um, a, a, a voting in favour of, of the application. OK, um, Councillor Ajma Garwal. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, along the lines of what um, Councillor Dennis just said, um, seeing that this will be going to consultation and the residents will have a chance to put their point of view and we will decide in six months, um, it, it sounds OK to me. Thank you. OK. Uh, Councillor Salman Shaheen. Thank you very much. Debate. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, well, Councillor Foote brought up history, and I want to go back even further in history. Uh, it was Jean-Jacques Rousseau who who said that the first man to fence in a piece of land and uh, and say this is mine and find people naive enough to believe him was truly the founder of civil society. He wasn't being kind. He was no fan of civil society at all, and. This, uh, this, this, this Article 4 application is, is, is offices, is the council saying we are not naive to believe and are not naive enough to believe that you can unilaterally, that anyone can unilaterally block off access to what should be common public good, a utility 
for all of all, all of all of our borough, not just for a very tiny minority of them. The Riverside is a common treasury for all, and that is why I'm strongly in favour of voting with officers' recommendations on this. That is not to downplay any fears around social distancing or antisocial behaviour. These are problems that affect us all in the borough. Uh, the answer, you know, if, if we have youth drinking at the bottom of our street, the answer isn't to fence off the street. It's to deal with the problem of antisocial behaviour. Absolutely firmly in favour of voting for this. And I would urge, if we do indeed pass this, officers to enact Article 4 tonight, because that gate is going up right now. The, uh, the horse is bolting. Let us, uh, let us shut that stable door. OK, thank you, Salman Shaheen. Um, Councillor Mohammed the mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. I think Council Shaheen's just uh, summed it up in a uh, in a very uh, well mannered way. So uh, I'll just echo basically what he's uh, what he's just said there. So, uh, yeah, thank you. No further comments. OK, and for myself, um, I, th I think personally I'm I'm in favour of the officer's recommendation, but uh, I do have some grave concerns about the monthly costs that the tenants are paying out uh, for for a piece of land that they think is private, but actually it, it it's also accessible to the public. So, uh, but again, I did say that this is not an issue for this particular committee, and as the um, planning application stands. I'm leaning towards it, but I do ha I, I do have concerns. Um, can I ask any of the members that if you're minded, right, to you've got the recommendation there from the officers, whether to have that recommendation or to move something that you you come in with. So um, I want I want somebody to move the proposal and a seconder for that proposal, any proposal. Right, Councillor Richard Foot. OK. I'll, or second, I I'll, I'll move uh, acceptance of the officer's proposals, Chair. OK, and Salman Shaheen yeah, seconding. Okay. Yep, OK, that's fine. So we have a proposal for the officer's recommendation for approval on uh, item seven. So we go to the vote and Remember, it's the prescriptive set of words that we need to use. So, Councillor Richard Foote. Thank you, Chair. Yep, my name is Richard Foote. I'm a member of the planning committee. I have been here for the whole of the debate and heard all of the uh, questions and answers, and I vote in favour of the officer's decisions. OK, thank you, Richard. Uh, uh, Councillor Michael Dennis, please. Uh, good evening. Yes, um, my name is Michael Dennis. I'm councillor for Chiswick Riverside and I'm on this committee. Uh, I've heard all the debate and I vote in favour of the recommendation. OK. Councillor Ajmer Garawal. Hello, I'm councillor Ajmer Garawal, a uh, member of the planning committee. And yes, I've heard all the debate, been here all the time and I vote in favour for the recommendation. Councillor Salman Shaheen. My name is Salman Shaheen. I have been present for the entirety of the debate, have heard all points of view and have formed my own. I vote for this recommendation. Thank you, Salman. Councillor Mohammed Omer. Hi, Councillor Mohammed Omer. I confirm my presence throughout the debate um, and the presentation, and I vote in favour. OK, thank you. And for myself, Councillor Amrit Mann, uh, I've been here for the duration of the debate, heard all the evidence and I vote in favour of the officer's recommendation. Colleagues, thank you. That's carried unanimously. That's approved. Yeah. OK, now. There are um, there are no further speakers, so I want to thank Deborah Sharples. For her case. And now we can move on to item four, which is the M4 motorway services westbound Phoenix Way. Um, after that, we'll take a short break and then do, do the remainder two, right? So, Matthew, you're going to do the motorway services, yeah? Yeah, that's correct, Councillor. Again, okay. I'm just going to try and share my screen with you.
hope that she'll be showing for you shortly. In fact, I'll start speaking as, as, as we go. Um, it's, it's a relatively straightforward application, this one. Um, essentially, what it is, is a, an application for um, some 16 car parking spaces and some electrical vehicle charging points. Um, it's at the, um, the, the Heston st uh, services on, on the M4. Um, I'll start off by saying the reason it's before you tonight is that because this is in Greenbelt, so technically it's a departure from the development plan. Uh, where there is a departure, um, then we have to bring it in front of you for a decision. Um, but I will provide our justification for development in Greenbelt as part of this presentation, which I, I hope will be relatively straightforward and obvious. Um, so hopefully on the scene at the moment you can see the proposal. Um, Heston Services, uh, there are car parking spaces you can see existing within Heston Services and um, just to the north of those car parking spaces are those 16 bays um, and they are in a little bit more detail. Uh, this is what the charging point looks like so you've got Tesla charging points and then Ecotricity charging points and um, the dimensions are on there they're, they're about two meters high um, and then these are some pictures of Heston Services as it stands so you can look at see the parking area there and um, just to the right of that picture is grasslands and within that grasslands is where they're proposing to install these car parking spaces and electric vehicle charging points. Um, so I'll just say that we of course take green pelt very seriously as officers um, but we are suggesting that this is a small area of Greenbelt within the curtilage of Heston Services so not contributing significantly to the purpose of Greenbelt and obviously these are electric vehicle charging points so they're an important part of um, our climate action plan moving forward and um, hence the recommendation for approval so if it's okay i'll leave it there and and invite questions if you have any okay thank you matthew for your report okay councillor richard foot yeah any thank questions you chair. um yeah i was I, I must admit matthew i was originally thrown when i saw the original report because i was trying to figure out what the hell this mask was doing in it and what what uh, you know, what it meant it was anything to do with electrical charging it had me completely flummoxed. But anyway, I've now seen the amendment has come out and said no, that was a that was a drafting error. Um, that's 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 what happens if you if you try and draft from a previous report that was written and you forget to delete everything. So I, I'm, I'm I have that habit myself many occasions. Anyway, moving on. Um, I I mean I my cars. I don't know, 12 years old, so I don't, it, it certainly isn't electrical, so I, I don't have a lot of knowledge about electric cars, but um, there is one thing, I'm trying to figure out how long it does it actually take um, to charge a car when you plug it in? I mean, are we talking about, so it's going to be there for hours, or are we talking it's a sort of 10 minute job or what? I don't really know. Um, to be perfectly honest, uh, neither did I entirely, because um, obviously, as we go through time, these, these are changing quite significantly. I mean, I, I, I believe that there is a number of hours to charge fully uh, an electric vehicle currently, but moving forward, they keep getting the times down. Um, and obviously, it depends how long they want to wait at this point. So they, they're, they're moving from one point to another. We have to work out how much charge they need to get to those two points. So I honestly couldn't say how long it would need to be there to be fully charged, but I wouldn't envision it being more more than an hour or so. On on the on the Tesla, I can help you because the, <laughs> super, the supercharge points which they're bringing out, they're about forty five minutes okay. for a full charge. If, you. if you if you do it at home on your um, electricity, it may take a number of hours. On the lower uh, generation electricity cars, it takes almost twelve hours. Right. Sorry. Well, a follow up question to that. Then, <laughs> Go on. Um, I mean, this is a, they talk about a service area. What does that consist of? Because I'm thinking of somebody sort of sitting around, um, you know, in, in an area. Is this a, a, a refreshment area? Toilets, bathrooms available? Um, so my understanding is that that's part of the service station. So it's, it's part of the service station. So your service area will be the service station itself. It would be so. Yeah. You know, I visions of somebody sitting in their car, no. actually watching the needle come up, and they're and they're busting to get to the next block of toilet somewhere. But I'm, I'm assuming that the facilities are there. Exactly. So it's Heston Services, so um, a normal service station with with those services attached to yeah. it. Okay. All right. That's that's all, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Michael Dennis. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I just had one uh, one question. Um, I, I noticed that 10 of the car parking spaces are Tesla and uh, six uh, Eco uh, City. Um, now, would that have a, 
uh, particular advantage for Tesla drivers. Uh, would, for example, if I had something like a Kia e-Nero car, would I be able to use those Tesla ones? Would I be able to use the Eco City ones? Um, uh, my just my concern is that, for, for instance, there might be quite a few Tesla spaces, but there might I, I could imagine a queue for other cars if they weren't able to use that one. So, is the Eco City ones for Eco City cars only, like the Tesla is for Tesla only? Um, and, or uh, how, how does it work in that regard? Oh, so I'm, I'm so sorry, Cass, I don't <laughs> have that information. Um, being a planning officer, we look at uh, the parking spaces, uh, what it sure. looks like. Um, sure, sure. There may be uh, some input from our transport planner. Do you, sorry, Kieran. Kieran. You know, enough. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm not sure about the Tesla chargers, but most um, non-Teslas will be able to use the Ecotricity charging points. I, I, I think I think the Tesla one is also used by others. It depends on the cost because you know they're going to charge us uh, 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 same. And, and I think the 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 plugs are generic plugs. It's just that Tesla has got the 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 super duper uh, uh, quick charging charge, right? Uh, uh, points, and that's where the, the money is. Where you know it's up to you whether you want to sit for forty five minutes or you want to sit for two hours. <laughs> sure, sure. So that that's helpful. Right. Um, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Ajme Garawal. Hi, thank you. Um, Matthew, uh, you say it's green belt area and you showed the grassed area, which uh, are we going to lose any trees there? Are there any trees around there which we might lose along with the green Richard's belt? Richard's favourite. No, so it's, it's it's open grassed area, so there's no trees proposed to be lost as part of this. Okay, okay. thanks. Right. Councillor Shaman Shaheen. Shaman? No questions, but just to clarify, um, I can't I can't speak for Tesla, but uh, Ecotricity, rather than being a car company, is a, is a green energy company. In fact, I've, I've used them myself uh, in, in the past to power my home. So I'd be very surprised if uh, if they were discriminatory over over which cars could use their services. I feel we may have lost Councillor Mann from the um, conversation. It's either that or he's not blinking very often. <laughs> yeah. It's a shame because he's answering all the questions on electric vehicle charging points for me. Um, yeah. Sorry, Councillor. It looks, it looks like we've lost Councillor Mann. Yeah, um, I'm going to see if I can get back in. I know he wanted to go for a break after this. <laughs> this one looks like <laughs> looks like he's gone already. Well, this is taking off that that stare that was coming out. I mean, that was frightening. <laughs> I wonder how long we should give it before we take a break to let him get back in. We're still broadcasting live. It's um, Sadiq trying to make contact. Yeah, it says in the um, protocol that we um, can adjourn for up to 15 minutes um, to see if we can get the chair reconnected and then the vice chair will take over if we can't. So just give them a minute to see if it's a bit quicker than that. Yeah, it does appear that his internet's gone down. Um, just going to try and invite him in again. Who's the vice chair for the meeting? That's Councillor Fitz.
Sorry, Wendy, can I suggest that we um, adjourn the meeting until we get Councillor Foot back in? Oh, sorry, yeah. Councillor Mann. Um, yeah, members, could I ask that you mute your microphones and turn your cameras off until uh, the chair gets back in? Thank you very much. So it takes us to um, 20 past six. OK. Yeah, yeah so we, we can come back at 20 past six yeah. or earlier, but not later. Yeah. Is that OK? OK. Yeah. Thank you. Cameras off. Cameras off.
Hi, hi, Chaz. Yeah, uh, okay. unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, was it called uh, my network drop for some reason? I don't know. Um, this is the wonders of science. Yeah. No so, worries. It's good to see you back in. I was going to say everyone's going to be returning to the meeting at six twenty. Okay, that's fine. I'll just mute, go to mute. Yeah. Uh, I'll see you back, Amrit. <laughs> that's good.
I can't stop it. Sorry, I think you're muted. Apologies. <laughs> no, I said I've, I've had my cheese and biscuits, so well done. got rid of them. I haven't seen much. Oh. Of them. It's like we're still live. I think we're still live. I don't know. We, we, we're live, but, but but don't worry. All right. So we, we won't actually start the meeting for. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's turned 620. OK, so we've got Matthew. Uh, who else we missing? Ajmer, good, good. And it was Mohammed Umair who led the boycott. <laughs> OK, let's see if we got Mohammed. Okay, Mohammed, welcome back. Don't worry, I, th I think we got similar problems. Um, Salman is next. Salman, Salman, yeah, Salman. Where is Salman? He's, he's on the he's on the bottom. He's on the picture. So yeah, he's in a call. Right, Salman. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good, good. Good to see everybody back. Uh, apologies for that. Um, uh, circumstances beyond my control. I think because of COVID, I think everybody has got lots of free time and they're all on the internet at the same time. So uh, we well, were... We, we, um, uh, we didn't move any further along from when we noticed. We, you, you, you had a very fixed stare coming out of there. Yeah, I, 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 I was just copying Mohammed. <laughs> Kaz and Mohammed Umair, I was just copying him. Uh, yeah. Um, Actually, where we lost you, uh, Councillor Mayor, was um, I was asking whether you had any questions uh, to Matthew. I have no further questions, Chair. OK, right. Uh, I've not got any, any any further questions to Matthew. So let, let, let's let's colleagues. There's there's no speakers on this, right? There's no objectors, no applicants. Uh, so we move straight into uh the discussion the debate any thoughts so let me go back to council richard foot any yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy uh chair um it's pretty straightforward i i had already noted that there was one tree removed but it's being replaced so that's why i didn't raise it <laughs> okay okay good good <laughs> <laughs> right council Michael dennis uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, no, I also, uh, I also, um, I'm, I'm leaning towards uh, supporting this application. I, I particularly like the, the, you know, the, the emergence of real electric charging that, that, that will also address the, the council's, you know, climate emergency, which is also on my mind. And, and this is a step in the right direction. So, very, I'm, I'm leaning towards um, supporting this application. No, good. Right, Councillor Ajmer Garwal. I'm fine, thank you. I'm supporting. Thanks. OK, thank you. Councillor Salman Shaheen. Thank you, Chair. I strongly support the officer's recommendations on this. I mean, yesterday we heard some fantastic news, which was that Norway had become the first country in the world where electric cars are now outselling petrol cars, diesel cars, fossil fuel cars. Norway now has 54 percent of, of, of its uh, vehicle market taken up by electric cars now more than half we we in this country need to do the same thing and uh, and we will be we will this country will be ultimately banning uh, fossil fuel powered vehicles and moving fully towards electric electric vehicles i hope in the future and Hounslow must play its part in that so i strongly support this absolutely agreed okay right um council mohammed umair thank you chair um i mean of course uh, like all other councillors i will I'm inclined to support. I mean, this whole uh, initiative is a great initiative. I mean, I mean, moving towards electric vehicles and I mean, and of course, having electric charging will obviously motivate uh, and provide more facilities for electric vehicles. So, uh, yeah, I have no objections. OK, right. And for myself, um, I, I fully take on board all what the members have said and someone is quite right uh, by 2030 in the UK, we're going to be moving to all electric anyway, and initiatives like this help to stimulate uh, more and more electric car purchase. And, and I think the Tesla, um, it's been particularly um, good because it, it's a very quick charging point uh, and, and, and that should make all the difference in, in making sure that people get on their journey fast uh, uh, getaways. OK, so I'm, I'm supportive now. Somebody needs to I'll make. Move, a... Yeah, oh, I'll, I'll move. 
I'm, I'm second. My, my next electrical vehicle will possibly be an invalid carriage. I'm not sure <laughs> I'll be up in a Tesla or anything like that. But, uh, anyway, it'll be all electric, whatever it is. OK, well, you, you've moved it and Councillor Mayor has seconded it. So let, let, let me go, colleagues, to the vote and remember the, uh, the, the prescriptive words. OK, so Councillor Richard Foote. I'm, I'm Councillor Richard Foote, a uh, member for Hamworth and a member of the Planning Committee. I have been present during all of the debate um, and I vote in favour of the officer's recommendation. OK, thank you, Richard. Councillor Michael Dennis. Hello, yes, I'm Councillor Michael Dennis um, for Chiswick Riverside. I'm a member of this committee uh, and I've heard the whole of the debate and I vote in favour of the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Councillor Ajmer Garawal. Yes, I'm Councillor Ajmer Garawal, member of this committee, and I confirm that I've been here all the time, heard all the debate, and I vote in favour um, of the recommendation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mohammed. Uh, no, Councillor Salman Shaheen. Sorry, Salman. Thank you, Chair. I continue to be Councillor Salman Shaheen. I've seen it all, heard it all, and I vote in favour. <laughs> OK, thank you, Salman. Councillor Mohamed Omer. Councillor Mohamed Omer, I confirm my presence throughout the whole debate and the presentation, and a member of the Planning Committee, and I vote in favour. Thank you. And myself, Councillor Amrit Mann, I've uh, been present throughout the debate. I've heard all the evidence and I vote in favour of the officer's recommendation for approval. Uh, colleagues, thank you very much. That is unanimous. That's approved. So um, seeing as that we've had um, an impromptu break, uh, we won't have a comfort break and move straight on to item five, which is plot G, Brentford Waterside. So that's pages 21 to 41. And Kieran, are you doing it? No, oh, sorry. Shane presenting. Shane, sorry, Shane. Shane, I've got the glasses on. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, good evening. Okay. Good evening. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. I'll, uh, I'll just share my screen as well. Oh, you're going to do it for me. Eh? Thank you. Um, well, we're on the parking theme, we'll continue with that. Um, this is uh, plot G of the Brentford Waterside scheme. So it's the land south of the High Street uh, scheme in Brentford where there is a, a planning permission which is being implemented. You can see um, that the, the blocks which have been agreed already um, has planning permission and it's under construction. Plot G is at the far um, eastern side of, of the wider site and it has permission for a building which would contain a multi-storey car park, about 30 dwellings and um, some leisure use as well. Um, this this application is to retain a temporary uh, multi-storey car park which was erected on the site um, and it was erected to satisfy a planning obligation um, which requires temporary parking somewhere on the site. It was envisaged it would be on plot J which is more towards the centre and down towards the waterside. Um, the, the developer I think um, in their wisdom thought that it was best to just go straight to the point and, and build the car park where the permanent car park is going to be. It's also a better location as far as um, just managing the construction process. Um, so people who are going to go to the car park during construction works won't need to um, drive through the centre of, of the site and um, same for pedestrians going to that, that parking station. Um, it's been built um, uh, out of concrete. It's not a finished building. Um, that's that was what it was like a few weeks ago. Um, since then, um, there was a consent to just paint it because it's uh, quite an unsightly, unfinished building. Um, there's some bright images there, um, just to, to to enliven it a little bit whilst it's there temporarily. Uh, the application seeks permission to retain it as a structure for five years. Um, it's very important to note that last August the committee agreed. The, the details of a permanent building on this site and it would be um, transformed with with uh, cladding to the outside. There'd also be um, housing, as you can see on, on that image there, attached to the building um, and the associated landscaping, paving and so on would be all completed. Um, at the moment, it's limited to 150 spaces and that was the uh, requirement for the obligation um, and that's controlled through um, automatic um, number plate recognition. Um, it's a paid for paint display car park which is available for the public um, and 
we want it to be operational during the construction to, to try and keep activity in the town centre throughout the duration of the works. Um, ultimately, it will be subsumed within that permanent building and there'll be a mixture of residential parking for residents of the new uh, development. There'll be also some town centre parking as well. Um, we do need to get the authority of the committee just to make some variations to the current legal agreement because, as I said, um, the parking was to be provided temporarily on plot J. This is now plot G, so we just need to, to make sure that aligns. And we also just want to restrict um, the parking numbers temporarily and also um, set the fees and so on for it just to align them with other town centre parking charges. Um, and that's it. OK, thank you, Shane. Uh, let's move on to questioning. Um, Councillor Richard Foote, questions to Shane on his report. No, I've got no questions, Chair. It's all very straightforward as far as I can see. OK, Councillor Michael Dennis, questions to Shane. Uh, thanks, Shane. Uh, no, no, not at the moment, thank you. OK, Councillor Ajme Garwal, questions? No question, thank you. OK. Councillor Salman Shaheen, any questions? Thanks, Chair. I've got quite a few questions, actually. I'll, I'll take them uh, in turn. Um, with the first one, obviously, um, it, it was a condition of the uh, the Brentford project, which I, is a fantastic project and I'm fully in support of, that there be a parking provision for um, the workers, the construction workers who are going to, going to be building it. But, I mean, at present, with this uh, this this hastily erected and uh, not particularly pleasant looking building, to put it mildly, I mean, what what usage is it is it currently seeing? Is it being used currently, or is, is it envisaged it will be used it soon? Uh, how many construction workers are currently using that site? Uh, it's definitely in use. So I've used it myself. Actually, uh, I had to go down there um, when I was in there. There's probably about 40, 50 vehicles um, in the middle of the day. Um, but as you said, uh, there's a lot of construction workers um, on site at the moment and uh, it would be a, appropriate for them to park there. Um, but it also offers um, pay and display um, for other people like, such as myself. I had to go to somewhere down there and used it myself. So it is it is operational. Sure. And I mean, when are we expecting the finished building to be there? I mean, it's 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 great that they've painted it and hats off to the uh, the artists. I think they've done a, a fantastic job um, sticking some very nice lipstick on a very ugly looking pig. But um, I mean, when when is it when's it going to be finished? Uh, it depends on on um, some of the other the other phasing because there's restrictions on um, the occupancy of um, some of the other blocks until this car park um is is completed i think i've been uh, informed that it would be 2022 they'd start to really get going on that permanent um building that we saw the images of and then it might take uh, a year to two years to sort of fully complete that um, but the intention is to do it as fast as possible but they are working on other parts of the site at, at present okay and i mean the other the one one issue that's come up quite a lot, um, certainly um, in terms of discussion around it on 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 social media and representations that I've heard, is that those who are opposed to the car park being there in its current form say planning committee members should vote against it and then it, it vote against this retrospective planning application and then the building the ugly building will be torn down. It's my view. My 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 view is that that wouldn't be the case. Can you confirm that? If we were to vote, what would be the consequence of us voting against this recommendation? Would it lead to the building being torn down, or would it not? Well, the judgment would be made. What's expedient to do there? It was built without um, obtaining consent in the first instance. However, it's very important to note that there's a larger building that has been approved on the site. So what you're effectively looking at is the the frame of that that approved structure. So there wouldn't really be strong grounds to, to take it down. We'd be looking to negotiate to get them to complete what's agreed already. Um, and I, I think I think with that um, agreement of the final details, I think some of the concerns about the building itself have probably subsided. Um, and there was there was a few issues about the number of spaces. So the original um, multi-storey garage, there was permission for up to 606 spaces. And there's concerns that that, that, that is obviously We've got air quality issues, a lot of traffic issues. We want to try and reduce 
um, congestion and just pollution. Um, the approved scheme actually has 519 spaces, so there was quite a, a substantial reduction as to what they could have built as to what they've actually finally designed. OK, um, thank you. Thank you very much for that. OK, Simon, thank you. Councillor Mohamed Amir, questions to Shane? I have no comments. Thank you, Chair. OK, right. Myself, no questions, Shane, uh, but still hang about just in case there's any other issues that they want clarified. OK, let's move on to the discussion and debate. Councillor Richard Foote. Um, no, I've not got anything to add for discussion, Chair. OK. Councillor Michael Dennis. Oh, uh, yes, I just wanted to say that I, I like the application. Uh, I think it makes sense. It's it's sort of sensible um, given the, the, the long term plan for the whole project to be completed by 2025. Uh, I think it's a it's a sensible, uh, sensible step to take. Um, that was all I was going to say. OK, thank you. Councillor Ajmer Garawal. Thank you. No comment, Chair. Thank you. OK. Councillor Salman Shaheen. I, I hate that car park. It looks disgusting, but uh, it's it's. It, I mean, it's, we just. I'm going to vote for the recommendation and just say get on and finish it as quickly as possible and get out of the way. Okay, Councillor Mohammed the Mayor. No comments for myself, Chair. Okay, uh, for myself, I'm with uh, complete agreement with uh, Councillor Shaheen and Councillor Dennis. Uh, we just need to get this uh, completed. So, anybody? Move a proposal, whatever proposal. Councillor Dennis. So sorry, Councillor Dennis. Yes, I'm very happy to move a, a vote for, for uh, approval. OK, <laughs> thank you. Councillor Ajime Garawal. I'll second that, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. OK, so we've got a proposal that's alive. It's been uh, proposed and seconded. So we go to the vote. Councillor Richard Foote, using the prescriptive words. <laughs> Yes, my name is Councillor Richard Foote. I represent the Hamworth Ward. I'm a member of the Planning Committee. I've been present for the whole of the debate and I vote in favour of the officer's recommendation. OK, well done, Richard. Thank you. Councillor Michael Dennis. Hey, Councillor Mike Dennis here. Uh, I am Councillor for Chiswick Riverside Ward. I'm on this committee. Uh, I have been here for the whole debate and I vote uh, in favour of the application. OK, thank you. Councillor Ajmer Garawal. Hi, I'm Councillor Ajmer Garawal, been here all the time, heard all the debate and I vote in favour for the report. Thank you. OK, thank you. Councillor Salman Shaheen. I'm Councillor Salman Shaheen. I've been present for the entirety of the debate, heard it all. Not again. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Councillor. It's fine. OK, all right. So, um, Councillor Mohammed Amir. I think that's where we left off. Yep. Councillor Mohammed, Mohammed Omer, I confirm my presence throughout the presentation and the debate, and I'm I vote in favour. Okay. And myself, Councillor Amrit Mann, I've been here for the whole debate. Uh, I've heard all the evidence, and I vote in favour of the officer's recommendation. So, colleagues, that's uh, unanimously agreed, and that is approved. So, before the internet drops again let's move on to our last item and get that out of the way that's uh, item six yates one two three bath road so matthew you're doing this that's correct councillor yes okay right far away if you'll bear me with a while, share the screen, but I'll start my presentation anyway. So, so apologies for this. This is not another planning application. What's happened on this occasion is that during the consideration and negotiation of this current planning application, the uh, applicants uh, resolved that they decided to appeal against non-termination. Um, thankfully, this isn't a very common scenario, uh, but they're, and they're within the rights to do so. But essentially, they've uh, taken the decision making away from the council and gone straight to the Secretary of State for a decision. Um, so. What we are asking today is, um, first of all, uh, we're asking you to agree with what would have otherwise have been our reasons for refusal for the site, and then to delegate authority to us to enter into negotiations for a section 106 agreement should the uh, appeal be um, acceptable. So um, if the inspector decides that they, 
will approve this application, um, we would have negotiated a, a Section 106 agreement to be attached to it, and that's what we need your authority to, um, to, to move forward with. Um, and so this is the eight site. Um, in happier times, we could have looked out of the window and seen it just below us. So I'm going to assume um, most people know what I'm talking about. So it's the eight site just outside Hounslow House, as you can see on my screen now. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll show you photos <laughs> as if you weren't familiar with it entirely. Um, so there's, there's the old Yates pub, um, obviously public house um, between two and three stories tall. Um, what we are looking at is a replacement scheme that is primarily co-living um, with some commercial uh, ground floor basement and uh, sh shared uh, shared space at first and second floor level, which I'll go through in a little bit more detail when I get to the floor plans. Um, but you're looking at the design of the building or what it would look like um, now and you can see in the background Hansler House so that's a view down from the high street towards the, the, the proposed structure. Um, now again you can see Hansler House to the left there looking back towards the structure again and I'm going to flick through a few more visuals assuming most people have their bearings by this point by virtue of where Hansler House is on the slides. Um, long view there down towards the building and again Looking south down towards the, the site and um, you can see uh, Hansler House in the foreground there with the building in the, in, in the background. And onto the floor plans. So um, the proposal is for, um, so it's a pub at the moment, so the pub would go and it would be replaced with uh, some public house use at ground floor level, um, some commercial space at ground floor level and then there would be shared uh, space for the co-living units above it at first and second floor level. Um, so we're talking like TV rooms, library, workspace and such. Um, co-living, if you're not familiar with it, is I think that I'm, I'm not going to call it a large house and occupation, that's not fair to say. It's not student accommodation, that's not fair to say, but it is a uh, uh, rooms which share facilities. So the room would have a bed, um, a desk, um, some small kitchenettes and um, facilities so that someone can, can live. And then instead of having, um, sorry, and obviously a, a shower bathroom, instead of having its own kitchen, instead of having its own proper living room, um, it would share those facilities with other occupants of the building. Um, so I'm now going to go through the slides and show you the basement and ground floor plan, which is the commercial space. Uh, and then this is I'm not sure if you can see it. Um, we're looking at a, a, a gym, a TV room, a studio, um, a dining area, again, a dining area, desk space. Uh, so those are the shared parts. And then as you move up through the building, you can see um, the rooms. So as I say, um, that they're not particularly large. Um, and then there's kitchenettes and shared communal space as you move up through the building, which I'm going to skip through now because this is uh, 15 stories. So 15 stories uh, of essentially co-living uh, apart from the first three floors. Um, so these are what the elevations look like. Uh, you've seen the, um, the the CGI, so again I'll, I'll flick through these, but it's a 15 story building and that is the end of the slideshow. So what we are proposing is to, uh, should it have been a decision that we were making, we are recommending that that application would have been refused. Um, the substantive matters are the design of the scheme, um, so it's appearance and scale, uh, which is anything a tall building in this location is meant to be of, of the highest possible design standards. Um, it's the absence of amenity space. Um, so we aren't talking uh, standard residential units, standard flats at this point. We're talking about um, co-living, but we're suggesting the, the amenity space that serves those units is not sufficient. Um, the third substantive reason for a feudal is that there is no affordable housing here and there is not an acceptable mix of housing being a single type of housing. So there's no two bedroom, three bedroom units. And uh, there are a number of technical issues as well. So um, energy flood risk, air quality and uh, as it stands, a lack of legal agreement. So those are issues that uh, there's technical outstanding issues that they haven't satisfied. Um, it may be the case that with further information, these would have fallen away. But the nature of the application is that they've um, gone for an appeal with those issues outstanding. Um, so, yeah, what we are asking is for you to agree with us to enter into a legal agreement on the basis of the content of the officer's report. And then if you do have any comments on the reasons for refusal or uh, recommendations for additional reasons for refusal, please do say and, and they will be considered and, and attached um, as suggested. Um, and 
sorry it's been rushed it's uh, the, the appeal statement's due tomorrow so uh, we've been forced to bring it to you relatively late in the day um so i hope that's a, a, okay with a brief explanation and i hope that explains the situation that we're in um, and maybe i can invite comments at this point okay. or, or sorry about questions questions yeah so council richard foot questions on this yeah. scheme um i i um, perhaps should have said chair at the beginning of the meeting i wasn't connecting but I did see a, dis, um, a, a design of this building quite some months ago um, I, I went and saw it when it was being shown in um, down in the high street somewhere uh, it's, it's, it's quite a long time ago um, but I ought to declare that as an interest in the sense that uh, they, they wouldn't have been affected by it but um, yeah I, I don't really have any questions at this moment I, I've got um, I mean, well, I do, yeah, I suppose. I mean, there's some of the things that's in there that I, I you know, I like, and there's some of the things I don't like. Um, but I, you know, and you said if we, we can add things that we don't like, but what about things that we do like? I mean, have we got a situation where, uh, you know, we could adjust that as well in terms of our uh, input? So we can't amend the design. It, they are appealing on the basis of the scheme that's in front of us. So we can't say, can you take this out or add this in? Um, if you want to take issue with our reasons for refusal, then then yes, by all means do so. Um, we, we should have that, that debate at this point and that discussion. So we can't say, can you move two floors? This is a scheme that they are drawing a decision from us on. Um, Richard? Yeah, 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 we I'm, lost you, yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to say that um, I mean, in terms of the design, yeah, I, I hated the outside of the building and I thought it was a, a real eyesore alongside uh, Hounslow House. Um, from that point of view, it, it, it doesn't come up to the standards that we input in the Hounslow House. And I would have thought that that was quite important that that did happen. Mm. As far as the, um, the, the, the uh, idea of co-living and its impact upon three or four beds also being in there, I think I don't have a problem with this being co-living in the sense that it is there because we're so close to um, the development inside uh, Hounslow Central there in, 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 in you know, the developments going up there at the moment where, you know, there is a mixture of those houses. And I don't and I think that the concept of this co-living is, is quite a good one for single people who are perhaps, I mean, it used to be commuting into central London to work or, or, or that sort of thing. Um, and, and they, you know, what they need is somewhere close to uh, uh, transport, etc. So from that point of view, I don't have any problem with the co-living. I do have a problem with the height. I do have a problem with the design. Um, and I do have a problem with the amenity space. But the rest of it, I don't. OK, Richard, thank you for that. Uh, let me move on to Michael Dennis, Councillor Michael Dennis. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I just wanted to add some comments of my own. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 I think this uh, building application, I think it, it came to committee and I think I remember seeing it. And I, I just my own point of view is that I, I liked the, uh, the design. I thought it was innovative and I liked the views from the streets and you know, making use of um, that space. I thought it was very good. Um, uh, and it's a great shame that there, there are so many faults which you um, Matthew you clearly you clearly pointed out and in the report as well it's a great shame that um, they've they've gone and not not really done anything to it to improve it because I, I would have liked it otherwise um, the idea of co-living I think there was another application on the present B&Q site uh, by the Chiswick roundabout where there is that co-living thing I do understand the need for you know flats that could have a family uh, and that that's on my mind as well um, but no, it's a great shame, great shame there are so many faults in the application. OK, thank you. Let's move on to Councillor Ajim, Ajimir Garwal. Hi. Uh, yes, Chair, sorry, I should have declared as well as, as ward councillors. We saw this uh, application earlier and the things which we said, I just echo what Councillor Foote said, um, you know, the height, amenities and everything we did complain about. And, you know, um, I mean, this um, co-living uh, buildings, they, I think they're going to be too many now going up because there's another application in for the Rosemont Hotel just down the road on Staines Road. Um, 
And these are all just for single people, not for families, which we desperately need. But as you say, there's not a lot we can do about it. But there you are. Thanks. OK, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Councillor Salman Shaheen. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, I completely agree with uh, with Councillor Dennis. I think I actually quite like the uh, the exterior design of the building. I think it uh, adds a, a sparkle to quite a tired high street, and I think it's important for the the regeneration of that area. But what a what a what a tragedy! It's such a such a, a colossally wasted opportunity when it comes to the interior. Um, I, I would vote against it just on the on the lack of affordable housing, but there are set various other problems, and it's clearly the wrong building for the wrong time. I mean, you look at uh, you look at trends in 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 property rentals and ownerships. People want more space. Uh, they certainly don't want shared space in the age of COVID and going forward. People are, people are looking for their own personal space, and this clearly doesn't provide it. Um, so, I mean, my but in in terms of questions, I mean. Matthew, if we were to, I, I just want to sort of understand the process. We 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 refuse it. They're going to appeal it to the um, Secretary of State. I mean, what what what's what are the likely outcomes going forward? Should we refuse this application? Will they come back with a better scheme? If um, you know, in an ideal world, do you think? Um, sure. There's a couple of questions there. Would you should I round them both up if that's okay, Councillor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, we, we aren't refusing it. Sorry, Councillor. Um, that's been that, that decision making has been taken away from us. Um, we are now going to fight an appeal and, and we are taking forward uh, the recommendations um, from this report and from yourselves to fight that appeal on those grounds. Um, in terms of the, uh, what happens next is that yes, if, if it's if it's rejected at appeal, um, the planning inspector will offer us a fairly good framework for reasons for refusal, and you would hope that with that framework we could then revisit the issue with the applicants if if design is a as a reason for rejection. And the inspector we can we can review the design principles, re-engage with the architects, and then hopefully come back with something that that is is more suitable. Um, the same goes for the internal arrangement of the property. Just just on the co-living point, um, I think that the, one of the main issues here is it's, it is all co-living. So uh, um, were we to appreciate the fact that there there may be a purpose to be served by co-living, we don't necessarily want schemes coming forward that are entirely co-living because if that becomes a model that is um, commercially viable, if I put it that way, then we, we could have some real problems hitting our housing targets and our family housing targets. And then just to add to that, yeah, there's there's no affordable housing here. There's no affordable housing contribution here because it's it was deemed to be a deficit and they couldn't give us a affordable housing contribution. So um, I am going to just reiterate that issue with that reason for refusal. Um, there's a better case to be made that if there was part co-living part one bedroom, part two bedroom, part three bedroom, that that might have been a, a more acceptable case. Um, I'm not making a recommendation at that point at this stage, but that would seem to be a, a better avenue to be pursued rather than just pure co-living for schemes coming forward. So I, I hope that explains um, A, the reasoning behind the reason for refusal and B, what happens next, uh, Councillor. But please do let, let me know if you want me to embed, uh, uh, in, enlarge any of those points. OK, Councillor Salmon. Yeah, I mean, it was only, it was only very quickly. It's just to understand the process of what's what's happened so far. So they, instead of applying to Hounslow Council, is it, am I correct? Correct me if I'm wrong. Instead of applying to Hounslow Council permission, they went directly to the Secretary of State, who what said yes, you can do it, and we're now saying actually, hang on a minute, is that what's going on here? No, so not not quite. So um. We have these 13 week target dates within which to issue a decision. Um, to, to be frank, um, when you get a scheme of this scale, 13 weeks is usually not quite enough. I, I mean, if it was great from the outset and then you can make a decision straight away, then 13 weeks is sufficient. But if it is deemed that it's not acceptable, if we want to engage with the applicants, if we want to negotiate with the applicants, 13 weeks is not enough. Um, so we would normally negotiate extensions of time and agree them with them. In this case, 13 weeks expired. Um, and they exercise their right to appeal against us not making a decision within that statutory time frame. So in effect, we didn't make the decision soon enough. I, I mean, I would defend our stance there by saying we did engage with them up to this point and they made that decision to take it out of our hands, but um, it, it is their right to do so. OK, thanks. OK. Councillor Mohamed Amir. Thank you, Chair. I think it's been uh, I think it's been pretty well discussed already, so I, I, I will add no further comments. OK, uh, myself, I mean, literally listen to all my colleagues. It's, it's, a, it's a real shame that there wasn't further engagement. I'm not I'm not against co-living per se, but I think this scheme, whatever that goes on that site, 
has has to be worked up and and it's it's unfortunate that they didn't engage with us to get a, a, a our, our input so that that scheme uh, becomes more let me say palatable right to this committee okay well look um we can release matthew now right and we can go for the debate um council richard foot richard you've dropped no okay yeah, I'm just yeah. getting the mute okay got you yeah. um yeah, I'm, well, I'm a bit confused by it all, to be honest, but I think that basically we're being asked to approach them to, um, to what? Um, to continue a debate and, and negotiations with them? No, the, the, this, this is in relation to uh, having a legal agreement set up which we which we weren't able to do because they took it out of our hands and and, and took it straight to the uh, Secretary of State for uh, his his determination. So uh, Matthew, do, do you want to do you want to come in and and actually tell us why or what 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 is it that you are actually seeking? Because that's that's the question that Richard is asking. Yeah, sure. So okay, um. Were we to refuse this application, were the council to refuse that, this application, um, officers, we have delegated authority to do so. So we, we, sorry, we don't need to come to you to make that decision, um, but we are asking your view on how to argue the case because we haven't presented our statement of case to the uh, planning inspectorate yet. So you have the opportunity to have an input into how we argue this case in front of the planning inspector. What we can't do without your authority is to enter into a section 106 agreement into this legal agreement with them so we need to, your authority to enter into a section 106 agreement in the event that the inspector decides to approve this application um, and the the content of what would be in that section 106 agreement is, uh, is listed in the officer's report so it's the standard ones that you hear from us it's um carbon offset, carbon offset fund contribution it's construction training it's um, um uh, contribution to cause control parking zones so we need you to say that it's okay for us to enter into that section agreement 06 agreement with them in the event the application is approved and um, the rest is requesting your views as to what should go into the appeal statement when we come to argue it richard okay, yeah yeah yep, I'm, I'm fine with that i'm yeah i think that in my, in my original comments i said what i liked and what i didn't like about the uh, the, the application and, and i think that stands um and yes i understand about the 106 um, yeah, it's an absolute. It, we, if we failed to go forward with that, we'd actually be stabbing ourselves in the foot. Uh, sorry, foot, not the foot, 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 but <laughs> the other foot. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so yeah, I mean it's absolute no brainer as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, we 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 got to approve the fact that we need to go for a 106 if that you know reaches that sort of stage. Otherwise, we'd be losing out on that. Uh, uh, that that finance okay thank you chair uh council michael dennis oh thank you chair yes i mean i i would i i've just been very uh impressed by the officers uh work on the on the report and i'm just uh yeah just just, just I, I mean again i i i was a bit shocked that all the um all the all the all the um uh all the units were going to be uh these these very small units so uh for for um support so one one person to use so um you know i'm 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 going to vote i'm i'm leaning towards voting in favor of the officer's recommendation okay thank you for that councillor ajme garawal hi um well as I said, we weren't happy with it when it first came. Yeah, the design might be nice, but it's really too tall. It even um, overshadows <laughs> hounds of a house and we look like a midget in front of it. But that's by the by. Anyway, um, saying we can't do anything about it, um, let's get whatever we can out of them. So, yeah, I'll support the recommendation. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. Councillor Salman Shaheen. Yeah, I think uh, with uh, Councillor Garrowell, I will uh, want to support officers recommendations on this. OK, thank you. Councillor Mohammed Amir. I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll also uh, vote in favour of the officers recommendation, of course, uh, with considering all the uh, 
cons that have been uh, stated out in this uh, presentation in mind. OK, right. And for myself, um, th this is something that we've seen colleagues in the uh, planning presentation that they did to us uh, some some months ago, I think about six to eight months ago, I think. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, really, I mean, as I say, I, I, I've got nothing in terms of co-living uh, as, as, as a design model, uh, but in in this instance, this is by or Ajmer says and Salman says it is is far too tall, far too tall, right at the centre centre of uh, town, um, where I think the light and and the impact of um, an open space being made much more darker. That that that's that's what this design would do. It, it's just a real shame that that they hadn't engaged with us, and and we we, we could have smoothed a lot of these things out. But uh, I, I'm I'm in full agreement with the officers in uh, in recommending uh, um, that we approve the for them to have delegated authority to do with the section 106. So let's move to the vote. Councillor Richard Foote. Yes, I'm voting in favour of the officer's recommendations. Yeah, I now, did, this is the only time I didn't say right the prescriptive words, and you you, right, you missed it. Okay. Well, Let me prompt you. <laughs> I was going to say it that way around just to confuse you. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's my excuse. Uh, yes, I, I I have been present uh, for the whole of this meeting, heard all of the arguments, and my name is Richard Foote, and I, I am a member for Hamworths. Okay. Member of Thank Black you. Community. Thank you. Well, and, it, and I'm, supporting, I'm uh, following the recommendation of the officer. OK, thank you. Right. Councillor Michael Dennis, using the prescriptive words, please. Yes, certainly, Chair. Uh, yes, well, um, uh, I'm Councillor Michael Dennis and I am a member of this committee. I'm Councillor for Chiswick Riverside Ward. I've been present for the whole of the debate and I vote in favour of the officer's report. OK, thank you. Councillor Ajmer Garawal. Thank you. I'm Councillor Ajmer Garibal. I'm from Hounslow Central Ward and I've been here all through the debate and I vote in favour for the recommendation. OK, thank you, Ajmer. Councillor Salman Shaheen. I'm Spartacus, otherwise known as Councillor Salman Shaheen. I've heard it all, seen it all and I vote for the officer's recommendations. OK, thank you. Councillor Mohamed Umair. Hi, Councillor Mohamed Umair. Uh, councillor for Falcon West Ward, and I confirm my presence throughout the whole debate, and I vote in favour. Okay. Now, for myself, Councillor Amrit Mann, I've been here for the duration of the debate. I've heard all the evidence, and I am in favour of the officer's recommendation. So, colleagues, that is carried unanimously, and that is approved to give the officer's uh, authority on Chair. the section. Hello, yes. Sorry, it's Wendy here. Um, Hello, Wendy. I've not got a actual note of somebody moving it or seconding it as it's obviously I'd, yes I'd, that's true as that's we need true. to sort of pick this up straight away that's um, true I'll, I'll, I'll move it chair councillor foot okay councillor foot yeah it's it's not you're a hat trick <laughs> richard okay <laughs> and had you make garibald to second it thank you i'm not using um, my foot at all it's a hat trick okay so now um ju just for um good record keeping that's been moved and seconded um do your votes the way you voted are the way that you voted or you want to change your votes council richard foot no i remain in support of the right. thank you uh councillor michael dennis thank you chair no i i, I remain voting in favor of the officers report. okay thank you councillor ajime garwal Yep, I remain supporting the um, recommendation. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Salman Shaheen. Yep, I I keep my vote as it was. Okay, Councillor Mohammed Umer. Yes, um, I remain in favour. Okay, and myself uh, same. Uh, my I stay the same. So that's carried unanimously, colleagues. Thank you very much. Now that brings us to the end of our cases, but there's a few items on the agenda that we still need to deal with. Let me quickly run through, then we can release you to your families. Right. Uh, the addendum report that's been taken in the body of the reports, that was item eight. 
Uh, item nine, any other business which the chair considers urgent? Well, there's lots of things, but I can't bring anything here and I've not been notified of urgent things. So the next the next date of the meeting, next meeting is the 11th of February. Now, given where we are with COVID and the likelihood of this lockdown staying till then, uh, we're going to be having another virtual meeting. So um, this is there. I think there is a likely to be another meeting in January, uh, making you aware because of the backlog of of uh, uh, cases. So we might need to meet more often. So the second one is towards the end of January. Um, I think you need to keep your eyes and ears open on the uh, as to the date uh, and people watching at home need to keep checking the council website for it. But uh, we have one that's booked for 11th of February. That's going to stay uh, again. These are all going to be virtual simply because of the uh, times that we're in. Um, let me thank all of you, right? All my planning committee uh, members uh, for your patience and certainly we did have that hiccup with our um, uh, internet uh, uh, service. I think Council Mohammed Amir's internet service provider is probably the same as mine because <laughs> they all fell together. <laughs> OK, but but any anyway, th these are rare, rare, but uh, I, I'm always, uh, you know, for a a meeting in person person uh, rather than a virtual uh, meeting, but we, we are where we are. Uh, can I also thank all of my officers, planning officers, uh, Matthew Reese, uh, Kieran and Shane uh, for doing all the presentations um, and also all our legal and um, uh, legal services and committee services. Um, can I also thank all the people watching for their uh, patience with us and and uh, being present for the meeting. Um, lastly, can I also thank our ICT producer for getting us to the end of this meeting, which I didn't think was going to arrive, seeing as a number of our members had, had uh, uh, lost their connections. Uh, but just to say to everybody, Happy New Year, uh, be safe, stay safe and also follow the government's guidelines uh, and hopefully it will be a happy new year uh, as soon as things begin to pick up. Uh, please stay safe, keep your families safe and let's hope for the next meeting. Right with that can I can I thank everybody and wish them a good night and a happy new year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.